All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us. This is our first public service perspectives presentation of the school year. So excited to be kicking off the year with um, three really great speakers today. Um, for those I haven't met yet, I'm Mackenzie Paharski. I'm the Special Projects Coordinator at the Voinovich School. I'm just going to cover a couple things real quick before we begin. Um, for those joining us virtually, we just ask you to keep your microphone muted to avoid any disruptions throughout, um, but feel free to use the chat to communicate throughout the presentation. Um, we know it's the lunch hour, but we welcome you to leave your cameras on to engage with us. We you know, enjoy your lunch, um, but you're welcome to turn your cameras on if you just stay muted, though. Um, you can also use the chat to drop your questions um, for our speakers today, or you can use the raise your hand feature to raise your hand. Um, for those in, in, in the room, um, downstairs in the leadership room, um, you are unmuted, so feel free to just raise your hand and we'll call on you as well. Um, the last thing to note is we are recording this session, so we'll make that available um, via our YouTube channel here in the next couple of weeks. Um, before we get started, if anyone on the call has any announcements or upcoming events they want to share with the group, I welcome you to go ahead and do that at this time. See, I have Lorraine here. Lorraine, do we have a sustainability film series announcement? Hello, everyone. I'm Lorraine McCosker. I'm an I'm a instructor and advisor in environmental studies. We have a master's program as well as an undergraduate certificate. Um, we've been running a sustainability film series at the Athena Cinema uptown for 10 years. This is our 10th uh, fall. And this coming week, we'll be offering a film called The Story of Plastic. And it's essentially out of um, uh, the Story of Stuff series. It's an incredibly informative piece about the impacts of um, of plastic globally as well as the petroleum industry. And we're having a very engaging panel. It's we're celebrating Pollution Prevention Week with the Office of Sustainability, who is one of our, our sponsors. And we also have a panelist from Rethink Plastics, the local community group who will be present and tabling in the lobby as well as speaking on the panel, as well as um, Elaine Getz, who is the director of the Office of Sustainability, and a student um, who will also be um, on that panel as well. So we always try to have uh, regional people, uh, faculty, and students uh, included in the discussion. So it's free and starts at 7 o'clock. You can come a little early if you like. And masks are encouraged. Thank you. Thanks, Lorraine. That sounds great. Looking forward to that event. Um, one other you. thing. Go ahead. What was that, Lorraine? I said thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and one other event um, to make you all aware of, homecoming's right around the corner, hard to believe. Um, so if you go to ohio.edu slash homecoming, you can check out all the events going on in the community. Um, but I highly encourage you all to come to our parade watch party. It's going to be at Howard Park. So it'll be a fun time. We'll have the uh, famous sour cream coffee cake. So can't, can't miss that. And, and this weekend is the famous Paw Paw Festival. If you haven't been, that's lots of fun. And I believe there are buses going uh, from campus. So you can go there, enjoy the day or time, and then come back again. Yes, can't forget Pop Pop Festival. Looking forward to that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. All right, so I'll go ahead. I'm going to turn it over to our Associate Dean, Professor, and MPA Director, Jason Jolly, to introduce our speakers. Great. Well, thank you, Mackenzie. I'll keep my remarks brief so we can get to uh, the speakers, but uh, very pleased to have uh, Brent Lane, who is an executive in residence with us working uh, on economic development issues in the region, uh, along with Molly Fitzgerald, uh, who is uh, the executive director of the Athens County Economic Development Commission, and Molly is an alum of our program, so I wanted to put that out there. Uh, and Kate Barani, who is also an alum of our program and now works with, uh, used to work with Molly, uh, and now works with the Buckeye Hills Regional Council. So it's always great to have uh, alums and see them doing well in, in their careers, uh, come back and uh, speak to uh, us and our students and our community about the work that we're doing. Uh, we're very fortunate that the U.S. Economic Development Administration gave us some additional dollars uh, under the CARES Act to investigate how we might help communities that were struggling with COVID and look for uh, new opportunities as a result of those uh, COVID impacts. So we engage Mayor Steve Patterson uh, and others uh, here in Athens County 
uh, with a COVID roundtable that uh, the mayor had put together to talk about how we might take some of the work that we were doing and uh, look at benefiting Athens County and, um, you know, looking at opportunities that might be resulting from uh, COVID and how we might deal with COVID's aftermath. As a part of that um, request, we were um, asked by the mayor to look at uh, how we might support remote work uh, in Athens County, uh, where are some uh, areas that we might uh, do well, what are some of our limitations, uh, and then how might uh, remote work uh, and or hybrid work benefit uh, Athens County. So we put together a scorecard around remote work, where is the county doing well? Where are their shortcomings and challenges? Um, and have been working uh, and worked through that uh, uh, scorecard with uh, Kate and her role when she was with Athens EDC, as well as with uh, Molly Fitzgerald. So this presentation stems uh, in part from that prior work and it's something that we hope we can continue. But with that, I'll turn it over to Brent Lane, who's our first speaker and let him go through the slides and appreciate everyone being here with us. Hey, Dr. Jolly, Brent Lane here, executive in residence at Boindavit School. Uh, and speaking to you from a co-working space in a turret of a castle in Ireland. And I bring that up first to brag about it. Uh, and secondly, just I think it exemplifies what remote work and hybrid work can potentially mean. In fact, our, our other presenters today are also presenting remotely. So I think we're we're walking the walk and, and talking the talk in this in today's presentation. I think it's very important to appreciate that uh, with the beginning of the pandemic in 2020, uh, I and our colleagues at the Wondervit School very quickly began looking at the issue of remote work not only as a necessity but the extent to which it actually presents an opportunity, particularly in rural communities. Uh, and it's that research that Dr. Jolly referred to, which we've also expanded to a total of, of 12 counties across Southeast Ohio uh, that the information I'm presenting today is derived from. Next slide, please. So as I, as I mentioned, we all began what economists would call the natural experiment in remote work and I'm gonna be using the term hybrid work from this point forward because the almost exclusively 100% remote work that many of us were experiencing through the pandemic for, for a large share of the workforce has, has, uh, has uh, uh, translated into a, a, a partially remote or hybrid work model that's becoming increasingly a standard uh, in those occupations where it's possible. But I, I'd like to point out a term that's often used in, in software coding is that some, sometimes there's a, an inadvertent error in the coding work that constitutes a bug that proves to have some unexpected benefits and actually becomes a feature. And, and I think that's what many of us recognize has come out of our experience during the pandemic in remote work. It was a necessity uh, and in many cases one forced upon us, uh, but also has become an option that many of us have come to value very highly. From an economic development standpoint, those of us who have worked many years in the difficult task of often rural economic development, trying to bring employment to rural workforces, uh, hybrid work is a, is a paradigm shift, to use a term I would never use unless it was true and it is true here. Hybrid work has begun to lessen the what was a tyrannical connection between your job and where you lived. And those two things were connected by physical commuting. Hybrid work has shown us an alternative work life. Uh, and that is what we'll be discussing today because it creates so many opportunities, not only for people who would prefer to live in rural communities, but also for employers, businesses that would prefer to locate in rural communities. Next slide, please. First to point out is that uh, while there's been a, a reduction in the level of workforce that's doing remote work or hybrid work, it is not going to be back to where it was before the pandemic. We have seen not only in Ohio, but in the US and I'm sure globally as well, a permanent change in the way people, many people work. And that is for the hybrid model and it's, and it's expected to persist as a significant percent 
of employment going forward. Next. But before we look at the future, let's think back to the good old days before the pandemic, which from, uh, from a workforce and economic development standpoint had a lot of limitations. Pre-COVID, we had a harsh reality in the US and that was that many of the jobs were either moving or being created in areas of the country that did not fit the population. So populations were either moving to where the employment was that, that fit their skill set, or they were going either unemployed or underemployed, not fully maximizing their capabilities. Result of that were a number of woes in terms of long commuting times, a, decl a decline in workforce participation, and a lot of discussion pre-COVID about skills gaps. We were hearing that constantly that there were skills gaps. So what we really were experiencing in the US was not a gap between workforce and employment. It was a gap geographically between where the jobs were and where the people with the skills were and either an inability or reluctance for people to move to where the jobs had relocated. Result was, unlike in the current environment, we had, a, we had an environment where both unemployment and open jobs were increasing. Today, we have a lot of open jobs and we have very low unemployment. That's largely a result of hybrid work. But one of the real, I think the greatest detriments of the pre-COVID marketplace was that many people were unable to advance either professionally or economically due to the limited job opportunities in their area of residence. So upward mobility in the US has been in stark decline in recent decades. A lot of this I summarize as an inefficient market. When labor and employment are geographically dispersed and inconsistent, we, we simply had an inefficient market for allocating labor to opportunities for employment. Next slide. Uh, I have to say Southeast Ohio exemplified that problem. And it's shown in, a, in a, a wonderful graphic I got from Ohio Southeast just last week. And it shows that in Ohio, people who physically commute more than 90 minutes one way each day, Southeast Ohio has the largest occurrence in the workforce of that. That's not just 90 minutes each day. That's, uh, that's three hours each day with a 90 minute commute. Southeast Ohio counties had the largest percent of their population that were having to physically commute three hours a day for employment. That's a, a very painful outcome of the kind of labor and uh, workforce inefficiency that we are experiencing pre-COVID. And in many ways, for a lot of occupations, it's still the case today. Next slide, please. On the other side of that coin is, to the extent that hybrid work addresses those inefficiencies, Southeast Ohio is also in the greatest position to benefit from the advantages that hybrid work can bring to reducing those market inefficiencies. And it's important to recognize, and I think it's been a slow point of emphasis, is that reducing those inefficiencies are not simply good for those of us who are employees, it's also a real advantage, advantage for employers who are struggling to find employees. The bottom line is removing some of these inefficiencies through hybrid work allows employees to optimize where they live and where they work, in many cases separately from each other, and for employers to maximize the potential pool of personnel they bring in and also allows them to, to base their location on other factors than just workforce. And in many cases, those other factors may be critical to their competitive strategy. For those of us in economic development, we've always struggled with two schools of thought on economic development. Are we there to help people, regardless of where they live within our area of responsibility, or are we there to help the places, the towns, the rural areas, the small cities? Hybrid work as the opportunity to bridge those two, those two what have often been conflicting objectives. We can help people have more and better jobs where they want to live through hybrid work strategies. Next slide, next slide, please. And I would say that while I think many of us experienced this and, and, and observed it anecdotally, 
uh, pre-COVID, it was a well-known fact in, in uh, demographic geography that most people don't live where they would like to. And this is manifest that some Gallup polls have been done for quite a long time, is that because of the requirement to be close to your place of employment, most people would have preferred to live somewhere other than where they do. And the areas that people might have preferred to live pre-COVID were rural, small city, and towns, rather than near major metro areas where most of the employment opportunities were. So this was the constraint that we were experiencing nationally pre-COVID. Hybrid work by breaking you know, for a lot of occupations or mediating that connection between employment and residence has, uh, has in many ways enabled people to consider moving to areas that they would prefer to live. And those preferences are often toward small towns, small cities and rural locations. Next slide. Now, the early discussions that most of us heard with the beginning of the, of the remote work and the hybrid work coming out of the pandemic, a lot of emphasis was on programs that incented people with remote work jobs to move into other areas, small towns, other states, what I call the digital nomad, or I would even call it somewhat critically, the gadfly strategy. A lot of emphasis, a lot of high profile programs that we're all familiar with were created to provide financial incentives for people to move into some small towns and then work remotely from those locations. That occupied not only a lot of media attention, it also stimulated in many ways constrained a lot of public policy discussions. When we began the work that Jason was describing earlier in Athens County, the impetus for that was really should Athens County for that matter, Southeast Ohio, be looking at providing financial incentives for digital nomads to move into their communities because there were some prominent programs in adjoining states to do exactly that. Well, that was, was the initiation basis for our research on remote work and hybrid work. Uh, the evidence in terms of economic benefits and particularly calculations of economic impact quickly revealed that rather than focusing only on recruitment through incentives of remote workers, that there were other far more significant areas of opportunity in economic development to capitalize on hybrid work. In particular, the, the items two, three, and four were hybrid work, as I pointed out, would now allow more people to choose to locate their residents away from their place of employment. So there were opportunities to bring in not just uh, uh, digital nomads, but full-time residents coming in to Athens and Southeast Ohio. But I said, much more importantly, there were opportunities for people already in those regions to optimize their employment prospects and their economic well-being. And, and lastly, number four, there were also those opportunities for businesses to either locate in those regions and then optimize their personnel pool from a much broader labor force market than they would have seen pre-COVID. Next slide. So we identified a, a broad range of benefits that extended well beyond the initial attention that was being given to recruiting digital nomads. And I've just summarized a few of the helm with a, here with a few points of emphasis. There are the, the obvious economic benefits. You're importing the income of people who are employed outside of your region. Um, Athens County in particular already sees a lot of out commuting, but there's a detriment to out commuting is that quite often you have a lot of retail spending that is therefore spent outside of the, the county in places of employment. Replacing physical commuting with remote work uh, brought in the outside income while reducing the retail leakage. And of course, we've all experienced this to one extent or another. The time that we don't spend commuting and the cost we don't spend commuting is a significant benefit to us economically, and it's a benefit for the communities in which we live because those dollars stay within the communities. But beyond those more obvious economic benefits, I think there's some more profound and probably more significant long-term benefits, and that is we've removed some of the barriers to work workforce participation. I mentioned pre-COVID, we were already seeing declining workforce participation for a variety of reasons. Remote work has allowed many people to enter the workforce that would have been perhaps prohibited from it for a variety of reasons before. 
And I would say for the long-term health of a community and the opportunities we have in Southeast Ohio, the opportunity to retain recent graduates and retain younger professionals who might otherwise have to look outside the region for professional advancement is one of the, the real game-changing opportunities here. Uh, it may no longer be necessary for many of our younger population to leave the area to find desirable employment through hybrid work. As a result of that, there will increase the upward mobility. People who have an initial job in, in Athens County or Southeast Ohio will be able to advance professionally through hybrid work. They may still be working outside the region, but to a lesser extent, perhaps only a day or two a week, that increases the opportunity for professional advancement and economic progress in terms of upward mobility. From a community economic standpoint and a regional economic standpoint, what you achieve is you get a diversification, not just in the type of businesses that are employing people, but in type of employment people have. So economic diversification, certainly a profound concern in Southeast Ohio. It's one of the benefits as well of hybrid work is people have a broader range of employment opportunities and employers have a broader range of personnel opportunities. Lastly, and I think for the, the, the long-term vitality of many of our communities is the, is the target demographic of the prime working age population. People between the age of 25 and 54 is a very important demographic segment in any community's vitality. That's the part of the population where people start families, where people start businesses, where people buy homes. And in lots of areas in Southeast Ohio, indeed lots of areas in Ohio, we're seeing a, a shrinkage in that critical demographic segment. We still have a lot of young people. We still have a lot of older people, but we've been seeing a shrinkage in that prime working age population, many of whom pre-COVID, pre the advent of hybrid work, were having to leave to pursue professional opportunities. Uh, I think the long-term viability of many of our communities depends on retaining that vital segment of the population. And is one of the real long-term benefits of successful hybrid work economic development strategies. Next slide, please. So when we looked at the set of economic development strategies that communities in Southeast Ohio could use to capitalize on hybrid work, we, we really emphasized the benefits that were gonna come by one, continuing hybrid work by current residents. Secondly, helping people who are still physically commuting to become hybrid workers. And that may mean an employment shift into occupations that hybrid work is a realistic possibility. And that's where the emphasis also came for upskilling. Uh, either retraining people for occupations that can be performed either remotely or, or in a hybrid model and also new job entry opportunities, for instance, for graduates uh, in a skill set that's uh, amenable to hybrid work. And that will enable uh, a retention of some of the population that might otherwise have left our communities. To a lesser extent, but still to a real opportunity, is uh, the area has real advantages for former residents who would choose to return if they could. <laughs> turn to the area to start their families, to buy their homes, if they could find the kind of employment that fit their skill set. That's an opportunity for Southeast Ohio through hybrid work. And then there's another group that has one form of connection or another, uh, but may not have been a resident who would seek out the area for a variety of other social and family connections. Sort of the, the least likely scenario is the one that many of us began thinking about first, the incentives of digital nomads to come visit our communities for a period of time in return for a financial reward. Uh, that in our analysis of the economic impacts, while that was the highest profile example that people were, were considering in, in hybrid work models, it actually turned out to be the least impactful and the most expensive uh, strategic option. Next slide, please. As Jason mentioned, in order to ass assess how well we're positioned to capitalize on hybrid work as an economic development opportunity. We developed a scorecard in Athens, and then we also applied it to a, a cross section of 12 counties across Southeast Ohio. And we looked at the factors from the literature and from surveys that were critical or supportive of hybrid work. And of the 10, they all had some role to play, but three of them really stood out. And you see those in gold. First and foremost, the obvious one is we need internet access just like we need highways and other types of utilities in order to perform hybrid work. Secondly, 
attainable housing turned out to be one of the real drivers for the location of remote workers and hybrid workers. Uh, the one of I think one of the most significant uh, um, forces in support of hybrid work were a generation of younger workers who are skeptical that they'll be able to afford a home in the metro area where they were, and are very uh, find it very attractive to be a home buyer and a homeowner in some of the small communities like we have across Southeast Ohio. But third, and this was a point that came out remarkably strongly, for many of us, we've had to be, or we've become our own childcare provider again by working at home. And too often that has meant a lot of women were not able to reenter the workforce. So remote and hybrid work is not a substitute for childcare. The availability of childcare actually makes hybrid work more feasible. Now the remaining seven factors were all some level of significance or another for individual populations. But those three are the ones we found in the scorecard were the most significant. Now, next slide, please. As I mentioned, we, we applied the scorecard to see where we stand right now in Southeast Ohio. Now that's an ongoing process. We haven't looked at all the counties in Southeast Ohio, but we have looked at a dozen. We began in Athens County. And what we found is that we're in a fairly good position. And in fact, we have some very strong positives. Attainable housing, at least as defined as affordable, is one of our strong suits, particularly for those who would like to come to our communities uh, as first time home buyers. Our cost of living is a real advantage. And we have tremendous assets, both in terms of outdoor recreation and because of the extensive education network in professional education. Uh, those are very strong and positives for the region. They don't apply uniformly, of course, but they are strong positives in general. What we found that there was a more mixed uh, record on were the ones we designated as neutral. Internet access in the region is generally either excellent or terrible, <laughs> as many of us have experienced. Uh, so that's a concern or at least an opportunity to focus some public policy attention on. The other is what we call remote workspaces. Uh, essentially, we've all been doing informal remote work. We've con we've used the end of the dining room table. We've used another bedroom. One way or another, we've all been uh, extemporizing on ways to do remote work. But as remote and hybrid work models become more codified, we need to see where necessary examples of like what I'm in right now, co-working spaces that are specifically designed to support remote work uh, rather than relying upon informal remote work locations. Although we'll still all keep working at, at, Brennan's, <laughs> at Brennan's Coffee Cafe when we get the opportunity. Those are examples of informal workspaces that have proven very important in, during the pandemic period and will be important going forward. And then the last two that we found that there were some strong advantages and also some disadvantages was in childcare and what we characterize as travel access. What we mean by travel access is not only highway transportation access, which the region has some excellent highways, what it really lacks is commercial air travel opportunities. So you may work remotely, but you will need to go to the office sometimes, and that office may be in a distant city that you need to connect to through commercial air service. Those are very limited in the area. The last two uh, items, remote work training and financial incentives, we found were, for the time being, a negative for the region. I'm going to ignore financial incentives for a moment, focus on remote work training. The way we do workforce development is the way we've done workforce development, not just in Ohio, but across the US for decades. We've got to quickly pivot work, remote work. We need to quickly pivot workforce development to acknowledge the occupations that can be done through hybrid work models and also the digital skill sets that are necessary to do work remotely. And I think that's probably a point of emphasis moving forward. In order to help our population benefit from hybrid work opportunities, we need to make sure that in our workforce development that we've made that a priority as well. So the last slide. Our conclusions, uh, and while uh, I'd say this is very much an evolving situation, uh, hybrid work is gonna be here to stay in a much larger percent than it was pre-COVID. Secondly, we, we know conclusively that it's, an enable, it's enabling people to move and, mac, and optimize their, their location preferences in favor in a lot of cases in rural locations. And, and I would say one of our most important findings was that 
while we may have initially talked about uh, uh, in migrating prospective residents, hybrid works major benefit are for our current residents, our current workforce, our current citizenship, and strategies that emphasize their ability to maximize the benefits of hybrid work will have the most significant economic development outcomes. And that's because we found very simply, it's not that incentive programs to recruit digital nomads will not succeed. The problem is that they, they don't succeed. The problem is that they succeed too small. They're simply too costly to scale. And the economic impact of any particular small set of digital nomads moving into a community is fairly minimal. So what we conclude is that the best strategy would be those that emphasize supporting resident a hybrid work over the relocation strategies. But in order to do so, Southeast Ohio has to be quite proactive in assessing where it stands in terms of remote readiness and implementing those programs and those changes that will maximize the potential of remote work and hybrid work for their citizens. And that's where I'm very pleased to turn this discussion over to practitioners in economic development and see how they've reacted to not only their own situations and their communities, but also some of the the very active interactions we've had with them in collaborating in this hybrid work study. Next and final slide. So thank you for your time today. Look forward to hearing both what my fellow pre presenters discuss and particularly the discussion we'll all have after that. So thank you very much for this opportunity. All right, thanks Brent um, for your wonderful contribution to this um, presentation today and I every time I come away from a conversation with Brent I think I learned something new or have a different perspective and uh, um, this presentation was was no different so thanks Brent. Um, I'm going to be adding to what Brent talked about but from a local economic developer developer practitioner lens so um, you can go ahead and yeah and I, I don't even know if I fully introduced myself I guess Molly Fitzgerald director of the Athens County Economic Development Council. Um, so exploring remote work for Athens County, you know, as Brent mentioned, it's clear now that remote hybrid work uh, took off during the pandemic, really out of necessity, and, and it was growing even before the pandemic. The examples that he mentioned um, that we're all probably familiar with by now, West Virginia, Ascend Program, Tulsa, um, and Ireland, which was where um, Brent was joining us from today and is really ahead of its time, um, are all great examples. And I had several people calling my office saying, Molly, we need to replicate these remote work attraction strategies that are popping up everywhere if we want to remain competitive um, and, and get some of these um, perhaps high wage earners from coastal cities that have a higher, you know, um, higher cost of living, you know, if we want to attract them. And I didn't necessarily disagree, um, but it was important to me that we align any strategy around remote and hybrid work with, with hard numbers and data um, and to explore what really makes sense for our unique community, which of course has similarities to say a West Virginia, um, but is still different in many ways. And, and so before we jumped into an attraction, specifically an attraction strategy, um, I felt we, we really needed to assess our community's level of preparedness um, and also understand what makes Athens attractive to remote workers uh, while also considering our economic and, and policy priority areas that we have here. Um, so I think next slide, Mackenzie, thank you. So yeah, this is why we engaged Brent and his team to do the, the scorecard. They uh, did a deep dive into the data. They applied the in-plan model to determine uh, what would work for a remote hybrid strategy for Athens and what wouldn't. Um, so this is a very condensed uh, overview of Brent's findings, but in short, we found that um, we needed to focus instead on our existing unemployed and underemployed workforce, rather than incentivizing non-local talent with, with financial incentives. So rather than paying higher wages, uh, or rather than paying higher wage earners from coastal cities and these higher cost of living areas, um, who, who really, I think Brent, you mentioned this, they don't they don't need a financial incentive to relocate. If they want to relocate, they, they can do that. Um, rather, we should be focused on uh, remote and hybrid work opportunities to increase our, our local labor force participation and, and um, moving forward, you know, determining how we can continue to build out our 
remote work network um, through these hubs, this hub I concept. Um, next slide, Mackenzie. So this is um, this data is from a survey or was used uh, or created by Brent and his team using a uh, survey of existing remote workers back in 2020 that we had sent out. Um, and we found from that that you know the largest share of annual incomes in Athens County for remote workers fell within that 50 to $75,000 range, um, which is still you know, well above the average annual household income for Athens County, but we noticed it does play a, a significant role in generating economic impact. So sticking from the results of that survey in this chart, um, you can see that a strategy focusing on more remote workers in the middle income, income range, that 50 to 75,000, um, generates much more economic, direct and induced economic impacts than incentivizing just a few high wage earners. Um, you can you can compare that 50, 28 um, remote workers making between 50 and 75,000 has a greater economic impact than four making 150,000 plus. Um, next slide, Mackenzie, thank you. So aligning strategy with existing economic development efforts. Um, the clear takeaway from the scorecard and white paper that Brent and his team put together is that we need a remote hybrid work strategy less focused on attraction and incentives, more focused on leveraging our existing workforce and our existing efforts that we're already doing. So deploying a remote work strategy that aligns with our public policies at the local level, will leverage that. So we'll leverage the following. Um, Enhance upward socioeconomic mobility for underemployed and unemployed, which Brent talked a lot about. Uh, recruiting and retaining our employees. This is a major challenge, obviously, for employers right now um, in every industry sector. You know, maybe remote work. I think we're seeing this more and more is a is a possible solution. Not all of the solutions, but a, a good solution. Um, and it, again, as Brent mentioned, will help employers better be able to find folks with the skill sets that they need by expanding their, the area which they could search for those employees. Uh, retail leakage, you talked about this, you know, how do we ensure that those dollars in, in the out community, um, how do we ensure that uh, dollars made in Athens are spent in Athens? And then Brent, you didn't talk a lot about the stickiness factor, but um, it, it is a part of the puzzle. So that I really liked from the, the white paper and the scorecard. Um, and I won't focus a lot on it because Brent touched on it, but essentially that is right, taking into consideration factors that draw people back to Athens. And we found that Athens, and I think the state of Ohio, Brent, correct me if I'm wrong, is a pretty sticky place. So, um, and then something that's not on here that I really should have added was, of course, broadband infrastructure. That's kind of an important one. How do we continue to work with our, our partners to build out that broadband infrastructure to ensure that businesses, individuals alike have affordable access to, to internet. And obviously that's something that would support this um, remote hybrid work concept, um, this network concept. So, and then of course the study found that without funding like that of Ascend West Virginia, which I don't think has been mentioned, you know, they, I think they had a, I don't think, they had a very generous uh, donor <laughs> help fund that program, which is wonderful. But without that funding, you know, it's prohibitively expensive to scale up that program to achieve economically significant outcomes for, for Athens, Athens County. Um, next slide, Mackenzie, thank you. Um, so where to next and, and moving forward? Um, we haven't touched a lot yet on this idea of codifying remote hub works like they have done in Ireland, right? Even pre-pandemic, -pan, pre Ireland was ahead of the curve in setting up remote work hubs. And I think that's worked very, <laughs> it worked in their favor. Um, but how do we, again, work with other partners throughout the region to build out this regional remote hybrid work network? Um, so for example, the Athens Armory at the north end of Court Street um, is going to be a remote hub um, where folks can come and, and, and work, whether it's hybrid or fully remote. Um, the KOP building, Knights of Pythias building in Gloucester, we've had conversations with uh, folks up in Coshocton County and Somerset and Perry County that have similar efforts underway. And 
you know, how do we align all of these, especially with the Ohio Builds funding that's coming out, as many of you are probably aware of, if and not if, when we get the guidelines, um, we should know more. But what we do know is that it, there's going to be um, a regional, a collaborative regional component that we need to meet in order to be successful in any application we put forth for that funding. And so starting to explore, maybe we use a transferable membership to connect all of these remote work facilities um, in an effort to secure more funding for the build out of all of them. Um, and then in conjunction with that, how do we proactively incorporate some of those other scorecard markers that Brent mentioned into our hybrid work plan, um, such as childcare? You know, are there ways to offer childcare at these remote hybrid facilities? Um, housing was another one. You know, how do we get creative and strategic and come up with a, a tax credit to offer remote, remote workers who are, um, or not even remote workers, anyone, uh, who are willing to make improvements, maybe to dilapidated homes to build up our existing housing stock. You know, just another example of, of ways remote work can, we can use remote work to leverage um, efforts, economic development efforts that are already underway. And um, the last thing I'll say for this side is, you know, none of these conversations um, equipped us with the knowledge that we needed to, to better understand where Athens is now in terms of those uh, the preparedness, you know, are we ready to take the next step with remote work? And now we, we have that foundation, which has really been um, critical for some of these ongoing projects around hybrid and remote work. So I feel like I've said hybrid remote work 50 times in the last few minutes, but um, next slide, I think that is all I have. So my contact information there for anyone who would like it. And I suppose with that, thank you so much for the opportunity, um, Mackenzie, Jason, and Brent for looping me in. And I will pass it off to Kate Perini with Buckeye Hills then. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, it's definitely gonna be tough following up after Brent and Molly with their fantastic presentation. So I'm gonna do my best here. Um, so good afternoon. And I would like to send a huge thank you to the Voinovich School for inviting me to speak on the topic of remote work today. Um, like Molly said, my name is Kate Preeny, and I'm the Special Projects Manager for RISE Ohio at the Buckeye Hills Regional Council. And then also a little bit about Buckeye Hills and who we are. Um, we are a regional council of governments that represent eight counties in Southeast Ohio. Uh, we cover and assist with a number of government programs, including having the designation as the Area Agency on Aging and as the Southeast Ohio Aging and Disability Resource Center. Um, but we are also the District 18 Liaison for the Ohio Public Works Commission. Um, we administer community development block grants, um, as well as serving as the economic and local development districts. Um, we are also the Regional Transportation Planning Organization. Um, so, of course, we assist our eight counties with quite a few things. Um, and all of those things allow us to take a holistic approach to preparing our communities for this remote work wave that is starting to our area. Um, so you can go ahead and switch the slide. Um, so now on to what we're here to learn more about. Um, as economic development practitioners in Appalachian, Ohio, we absolutely believe that there is more to life than where you work. Um, as a result of this, we strive to create communities where people actually want to live, work, and play, and in communities that are, of course, convenient for them to do so. Uh, so we believe that there is much more to retaining current remote workers, creating opportunities for remote work for our current residents, and potentially attracting more re remote workers than just providing co-working spaces. Um, it is our ethos that we must have vibrant communities for all sorts of folks to live, work, and play. Um, and we put this ethos into practice by taking a holistic approach to economic and community development, and we often leverage public-private partnerships to accomplish our goals. Um, in order to have an attractive, vibrant community, we must support our communities in having adequate and attainable housing, opportunities for entertainment, shopping, and outdoor recreation, access to great schools, child care, aging care, and medical care, as well as access to thriving downtowns with businesses, and at the basic level, access to broadband, cell phone service, and, and transportation, including roads and public transportation services. Um, we also assist our communities in having adequate infrastructure to accommodate current and potential residents, including water, 
wastewater, electric, gas, um, electric vehicle charging stations, amongst other essential amenities. Um, you can go ahead and switch the slide. So it's of course not just up to the economic development practitioners throughout the region. We must ensure that we're leveraging public-private partnerships by fostering and forging working relationships throughout the region and beyond to create these vibrant communities that we are striving to have. Um, these partners can often be government, but they often appear as local business owners and investors, as well as not so local investors and developers. Um, we think our region is strong and attractive for obtaining remote workers, um, uplifting our current residents to take on remote work opportunities, and attracting additional remote workers to come live, work, and play in our region. To be successful in this goal, we must address certain aspects for communities to accommodate the needs that remote workers have, such as broadband expansion and deployment, supporting the infrastructure needs for communities, and work to strengthen the current assets that our current lease community have current communities have that make them uh, such vibrant and thriving places. Um, we also have to address our current workforce and prepare them for these remote work opportunities. And we have done this through partnering on efforts such as building bridges to careers and partnering with our area workforce development boards amongst other initiatives. Um, we also focus on creating, increasing the viability of remote work in our region which will also aid us in accomplishing our goal of economic diversification throughout the Appalachian Ohio region, especially in preparing our current and future generations for the workforce needs of the future. Um, you can go ahead and switch the slide. Um, at Buckeye Hills, we also support our communities with grant and loan applications and grant and loan administration to aid in completing the projects necessary to maintaining and creating vibrant communities. One such program, uh, the Jobs Ohio Vibrant Communities Program focuses in part on the increase of co-working facilities throughout our region. In the coming year, we hope to target vibrant communities applications in all four of our eligible cities. Um, and additionally, we're also doing our part to prepare our communities for the $500 million available to Appalachian Ohio communities through the Ohio Build Appropriation. Um, of course, pending the release of those guidelines, um, from ODOD whenever those come out. So, um, and we're definitely wanting to target the increase of co-working facilities for our current remote workers and also for uh, any remote workers that we attract or the ones that uh, we give opportunities to for our current residents. Um, and then you go ahead and switch the slide. Um, so that was basically all that I had to say. Um, so with that, I would like to thank the Buena Vista School again for inviting me to present on this panel today. Um, I have provided my contact info on this slide if anyone shall need it. Um, and I look forward to any questions that audience members may have. Thank you both so much. Really appreciate it, Brent, Molly, and Kate. Um, we have just about 10 minutes left. So when I open it up for questions, feel free to raise your hand, unmute yourself, drop questions in the chat um, for our speakers. You can also send questions to me as well. Um, and I do have one question that was sent to me um and i don't know brent molly kate one of you can take this or, or all of you um so so what's needed to move uh remote work forward in the region uh, you you have a study molly your group's doing some things but how, how do we how do we make this actionable um so that uh a really a unique and this is not part of the question this is my editorializing <laughs> question what i think of as a unique um opportunity and moment in time where, as Brent said, the paradigm's changing. Uh, how do we meet the market before others do so we can capitalize on it? Um, I'll start by saying I don't think we're going to get there before others necessarily um, because we are seeing so many other communities capitalizing on the need for remote work. Um, and so I've, I've kind of shifted my view, especially after the white paper, Brent's white paper, from feeling in competition with other communities to really building on best practices, seeing what's working, but also seeing what's working for our community, right? We are unique. Um, and then the regional component, I think is going to be huge uh, because especially in Southeast Ohio, we are unique down here and where we have to be regional if we want to be successful. Um, and so that's why I think what part of the question was, what do we need to make this happen? 
um, money. <laughs> we have a lot of wonderful projects that are what you would call quote unquote shovel ready. You know, they're ready to be implemented. They just need um, some funding for, uh, for example, the Armory, KOP. Those are two of the examples I gave um, to really turn on the lights and get this thing operational, right? Um, so I'll, I, those are my comments. I'll let Kate and Brent chime in too. Um, so, I mean, I really think that our communities are starting to put in the work to prepare for um, attracting any additional residents, but also to support the residents that we currently have. Um, and I think that some of our K through 12 and higher education partners are starting to address this as well um, by having those programs that give our students and future workers um, the skills that they need to be successful in the current and the future workforce. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's how that I would answer that. Well, I've got a few very specific things to do. First, we need to acknowledge in economic development that the vast majority of the economy does just fine without our involvement. Uh, and by that, I mean remote work and hybrid work is has happened, is happening, and will continue to happen in Southeast Ohio. What we can focus on in the short term, we used to say this in economic development, the first step in supporting something is to decriminalize it. The effect of the pandemic was to take the concept of working remotely and decriminalize it. Like it or not, in the workforce, there was a stigma against remote work. Post COVID, that stigma has been largely removed. We have decriminalized remote work. So the remote workers that we surveyed in, were surveyed in Athens County were already doing it. What you can do now is facilitate the existing remote work. Secondly, what you can control is within the public sector, will you be codifying remote work? Does the city of Athens, does Athens County, what are their remote work policies going to be? Control what you can control. And that would be to focus on within the public sector, adopting remote and hybrid work policies that facilitate and enable remote work within the economy right now. The other thing to look at is the infrastructure to support remote work. Uh, it will be very difficult to fix the holes in internet access at the home, but the home is not the only place in which remote work takes place. If you look at your own experience, it will be perfectly representative of what we're dealing with from a public policy standpoint. If you were to map all the various places where you have worked remotely, that is your remote work infrastructure. And it is at home, and it is in the car, and it is at a coffee shop, and occasionally it will be within a co-working facility. The hubs that they've developed in Ireland simply recognize that for many locations for remote work, we cannot resolve the internet access issue soon enough. So there's a role for centralized locations like hubs. And the, the if you're working at home as often as I've been, you about 90% of what you need is there. But when you need a scanner and when you need a copy machine and God forbid you need a fax machine, you need to be in a facility that has those things available. So there are some very low hanging fruit some of it is in making sure that the level of work that's going on remotely in your communities is facilitated. In some case, that may be working with local businesses like coffee shops. Ask them, how can you help them help the people who use that as a, as a remote working location? And also, I think very much the hub concept is going to be a real opportunity for Southeast Ohio because there will be situations in which people need to come to a facility with a proper set of business services, and in some cases, the, the kind of acceptable internet access. But there are a lot of reasons why people would want to use a co-working facility rather than working from home or working from a coffee shop. Those things are going on right now. We can optimize the existing workforce behavior. And I would also start saying Athens, or certainly Ohio University through its campus system, what are we doing to help students who graduate who would like to stay that to me is another prime opportunity to work with them to find hybrid work opportunities. We want them to stay. And lastly, I would point out, when we see major new employers coming to nearby metro areas, those are opportunities to explore 
hybrid work opportunities for our citizens. I, I'm going to use a phrase I swore I wouldn't use. We want to extend the radii of the commuting shed through hybrid work. The distance people are willing to commute on a daily basis, if they only had to commute once a week, they could commute a longer distance. So as new employers come in outside of Columbus, the commuting shed, the, the workforce that might work there is greatly extended by the reduced physical commuting requirements that are part of hybrid work. So I think we have some very immediate low hanging fruit to deal with and, and longer term, simply making sure that some of those other attraction factors for both current remote workers and prospective ones are highlighted. One of the advantages of a program like Ascend West Virginia wasn't necessarily the financial incentive, it was really a marketing investment. They invested in, that, that incentive raised the profile of West Virginia and made hybrid work seem more feasible. That's one of the things you can also do uh, within our local government is to make sure that we're emphasizing the, the attractiveness of our communities in Southeast Ohio for, for hybrid and remote work. But I, I, I can see a number of very specific, not particularly expensive measures that can be taken right now. And the very first one I would say, if I'm talking to a mayor, I ask, what are your hybrid work policies? Are you forcing people to come into the office five days a week? Or are you adapting to the preferences of your employees right now? So we can do a lot to benefit our current residents in Southeast Ohio. We can do some things to attract new residents. And I think one point of emphasis should be retaining new graduates from high schools, two-year uh, technical schools, four-year colleges, and providing them a means to remain in these communities. I'll close with one thing that, that Molly alluded to. Uh, the U.S. Census characterizes states based on the level of in-migration and out-migration of natives as either sticky or magnets, and occasionally both. Ohio, from a census standpoint, standpoint isn't particularly magnetic, but it is very sticky. So if you're focused on serving people who want to come to Southeast Ohio, it's going to be primarily people who want to come back. That's your strategic advantage. Yeah, there are other states doing things that are perhaps ahead of us in terms of marketing and other programs, but your advantage is the stickiness, the affinity people have for Southeast Ohio and hybrid work could enable their return, could enable their ability to buy the first home, could enable their ability to start a family, could enable their ability to stay within the community in which they grew up or return to it. No one else has that advantage over Southeast Ohio. That is yours exclusively. Hybrid work gives you an opportunity to exploit it. Thanks. I, I like the stickiness term and, you know, thinking about my four friends that have moved back for the past year and bought houses here and, you know, they, they're moving back. They're coming to Southeast Ohio. They miss it. Now they, they've proven, we've proven since the pandemic, you can do this remote work. So I like, I like the stickiness. I'm going to have to mention that to them that they just, it's, it's stuck for them. Um, but I realize we are at one o'clock. I want to be conscious of time. I know we didn't have a lot of time for questions, but they did get their emails and I'm happy to send that out as well if folks want to follow up on anything. Um, but I really appreciate Brent, Molly, and Kate, you guys presenting to the school today. Um, do want to remind folks to please um, hold the date for our next um, public service perspective session. It's going to be October 28th. Um, Elaine Hazau the assistant professor at Kent State University School of Peace and Conflict Studies will be coming to visit us. Um, so please hold the date for that. And I hope you all have a great weekend. Thank you so, so much again. Thank you. Thanks guys. Take care. Thanks everyone.